Awesome. What's up, everyone? Thank you for joining us on, uh, I guess, yeah, Wednesday. I'm not even sure what day of the week it is anymore, but yeah, it's a Wednesday. So thank you for joining us for another mission briefing. I have with me Michael Watson. Uh, thank you for joining me. How's it going? Oh, I'm super excited to be here. Yes, absolutely. I'm super excited for you to be here. Uh, Watson hasn't been uh, on the stream in a while. Last time we did some cool stuff around Federation. And funny enough, we're actually going to be uh, talking about this subject again, but from a totally different angle. So uh, I'm very excited for today. We're going to be introducing a tool that the solutions team uh, has created uh, uh, to help them when working with uh, companies who are trying to work with federated graphs. And I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to like destroy or mangle um, any of this. Uh, you could speak to it way better than I can. But yeah, so that's why we're here for introducing Apollo Workbench. And uh, Watson, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about what work Workbench is and how it came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in my role, I'm a solutions architect at Apollo, and I work with uh, all of our enterprise customers on their graph adoptions. And, you know, most of my work surrounds Apollo Federation. And a lot of teams are thinking about consolidating their GraphQL efforts with Apollo Federation. And once you've made that decision, the next step is starting to design out your federated graph. Whether that's I have a monolith existing today and we want to start breaking that out into pieces, or you're starting from a greenfield, you know, new application out there. How am I going to actually design this out? And so in working with uh, our customers in this, there became a very uh, recognizable pattern across all the teams where they would be thinking about some governance structure of how they're going to evolve their graph, how they're going to make yeah. changes. And a lot of times it start out with like a Google Doc or something, you know, and they're just kind of writing out like, well, this is the idea of what we want to change, the data structure, like what we want to add. And it was a very abstract conversation. Yeah. Um, and Workbench is really a tool that I created uh, to work with our customers in a way of designing out schema changes for a federated graph but without having to write any code. Just really focus on does my piece work with the graph? Does it work with this operation? How is that operation going to be executed? And then once you come to agreement with all that, you now have something you can go back and start implementing before, you know, you made sure everything works out. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny just even hearing you talk about that, like just figuring out how it's going to be executed. Like, I think we often like take for granted that as soon as you're in kind of a distributed graph uh, uh, architecture like this, like, yeah, like there could, there, there becomes this almost black box or anonymity about like where these queries are going and what's being executed. Not to mention how many teams in, in many situations that that's going to apply to. So going back to what you're talking about with this abstract conversation, it's like, how many times do you have to repeat and build up the scenario in someone's head and get them enough information for them to be able to even, you know, uh, uh, think about about um, uh, the, this abstraction, this idea of like uh, altering the graph, right? It's a lot to kind of take in your brain um, and to repeat that across many people. So I, yeah, this, that alone is like um, a strong selling point right there. Yeah, and you know, I think the, you know, the, the real thing I love about Workbench is it's really a great example of the type of tooling and what's possible due to the strong declarative nature yes. of Apollo Federation. Yep. Right. We're able to understand, you know, where our service boundary owners are of what types that starts enabling discovering what I can extend yep. as as far as possibilities, you know, a little bit easier. So it's it's a, a tool that I've seen um, get a lot of excitement uh, around. And it's something that I, I hope an open source uh, in the very near future. Oh, so sad. it'll be available for, you know, everyone to kind of see what's in there, because I think at the heart of it, it's really taking advantage of a couple things and I can sum them up in just a few pieces. Yeah. One of the things it's doing is individual schema files. How can I make sure they're composed? And if there is any composition errors, what are those errors, right? So how point. do I actually compose those schema pieces together? And that's just using the internals of the Federation library. And the other is that execution path. We have query plan that gets generated every time there is an incoming request to the Apollo gateway in a federated architecture and understanding, you know, how will this operation execute 
uh, is such a fundamental key piece. But you know, you have to know a little understanding of the internals of the the Rust um, query planner. That's a Wasm inside of the gateway, and so this helps uncover some of those pieces. And you know, although the tool is something that you know I think a lot of people will just want to download and, and use to just design. But I also think it's something that's an example to maybe be an extension point for other teams and an experience that you can try and deliver inside of your own uh, federated architecture and organization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's just like, again, circling back to removing the black box, removing the mystery, uh, making this information available a lot faster. Uh, and, and more visual too, like it's not even just about like writing it down and tracking it somewhere, but um, you know, visual representations of the, the queries and, and the relationships. And I love what you said too, about like tracking the errors. Like what if you accidentally um, incorrectly uh, configure something or you try and extend a property or you're thinking that, that, you know, the key field is something other than what it actually is. Like knowing about this stuff before you're trying to run these services and actually having it well planned out, um, you know, before you even get into the implementation uh, implementation uh, phase is just like also a huge benefit to the development life cycle, right? Like this is, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the most common thing I saw, and I see this just in, I think, every organization, and if anyone, you know, on the stream is looking at Federation or even trying it out right now, you know, one of the things you've probably built out is this templated project that has, you know, a gateway and maybe some services and maybe you're using some of the mock functionality or something, but you essentially use this template as a way to kind of mock out some of these changes. You know, maybe you're the champion in the organization that's helping guide other people through how to make changes to the scheme or onboarding them. And you're using that project as a way to deal with that. But, you know, it's kind of like, we're gonna add a new service. So I have to duplicate the template I have to copy one of the folders inside of there, make a bunch of changes inside that folder, and then I can run all that just to see if that new scheme while I was planning actually composes with everything. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, for me, as someone, a big surprise on the developer experience team, uh, de developer like, like feedback loops and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm like very hyper focused on these like uh, productivity boosters, right? Things that don't seem like, you know, might not even seem like upfront, they're going to save you a lot of time. But just when you think about the amount of times that you're going to have to alter a graph in a federated architecture, um, you know, it just starts to compound, right? Like every single time you're saving minutes to, uh, you know, hours even, right? Like uh, between all the communication and finding errors early and being able to have a solid plan before you go into development, you know, it just, you end up just saving like an astronomical amount of time. And that's just one person. So it's like, as this spreads out, to teams and more people are taking advantage of it. It becomes part of the, the process. Yeah, just like, you know, all about that smaller feedback loop. Yeah, get, get that feedback as quick Definitely. as possible. So I feel like we've talked it up quite a bit, um, you know, all the hype. Uh, so should we should we take a look? Should we like dive in and-, and Yeah, let's and jump into it. All right, awesome. So what I'm gonna do here, folks, I'm gonna switch over to um, our uh, uh, view desktop and so i am live shared into uh, uh watson's bs code here so this is actually uh um his instance running and uh yeah so what do we what are we going to do here what's the first step what do, what do i want to do if i'm going to use workbench yeah so workbench is you know as i said i'm going to be releasing um the repository in some open source fashion in the near future and there will be re uh the releases section in there where you can download the vsix um, what you'll want to do uh, when you do download is you'll want to install from VSIX, um, just install that download. Uh, one of the things I do recommend is also installing our Apollo GraphQL um, extension that is in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, it helps with the IntelliSense type completion stuff and plays into that whole picture. Got it. Okay, so I've got the Apollo GraphQL um, extension installed. Uh, but now I want to install one from uh, my computer. So do I do that from here? Yeah, here we go. Install yep. from VSIX. There we go. All right. So, so let me do and that. that'll give you this little workbench icon. Um, it's got like a little screwdriver and a wrench. I'm pretty proud of that icon. It's <laughs> the little things, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
Heck yeah. Um, now, there's a couple different workflows that are really inside of the workbench, but one of the ones at really the heart of it is being able to model out a design change from an existing graph. Yeah. And so there is this Apollo Studio section um, towards the bottom where you can actually log in using your user API key. Um, so if you actually opened up the command palette, there is an Apollo login feature. And that just has you enter in your user API key of what you get from your personal settings. Yeah. And that's what will load the organization with the graphs that are available in that organization. Very cool. I believe my extension is still installing right now, but uh, as soon as it's done, we'll flip over and start taking a look at it. Hopefully it goes smoothly because I am doing a VS Code live share, so I'm not I'm not really sure what, what the implications are there. I guess we'll have to see. If we have to reload, yeah. we might have to redo a, a live share. We'll see. Yeah. Only time will tell. Uh, question in the chat. Need to read to know what's in it. Oh, I had thoughts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nah. Kyle's pretty excited about the Rust uh, query planner. So uh, Kyle, who's in chat, works at StockX. Uh, they they have big federated uh, architecture. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think I've actually talked with some of the members of StockX team. Yeah, awesome. Cool. So, okay, here we go. So completed installing. Uh, so we are good to go there. So now let's just see. So like it should essentially, so it shows up here, but I have too many extensions for y'all to see the icon. I'm so sorry. I feel like, it, um, I've let you down there, Watson, but, uh, all right. So I'm, if you right click on that, like, oh, here bar, it is. you can actually unselect some icons uh, and reselect other ones. Ooh, that is good to know. I didn't even know that. But that's really good to I'm know. I'm a VS Code power user, so yeah, yeah. I, I got I got all the tips and tricks. I used to think I was, but apparently not. All right, so I've got this um, uh, 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 notification down here. So it didn't find a user API key. Are we going to need that? Like, will I need that for now, do you think? Because I can flip us to like a restricted screen and I can enter an API key, but I don't know if I need it. If I need it, I'll do it. What do you think? Yeah, you you don't need it for for this second. What we can do is I can actually send you uh, a workbench file that we can look at for later on. But to start out with, we can actually just start creating things from scratch. Okay, that's cool. So then I'm just gonna close this and get rid of that, and here we are. So, um, yeah, what's what's my next step? So I got the workbench working, and you still seem to be in the VS Code live share. I think we're good there. So yeah, what do we do? I'm super pumped. Yeah. So. I'm just watching, actually, I should I should be watching your screen. Um, so the first thing inside of there, at the very top left, you'll see this local workbench files. And there's this kind of getting started section. Yeah. Uh, that getting started section has some markdown files when you click on each one of those rows. Oh, see, kind of I'm not, previews some instructions. I think, uh, so I'm not seeing a getting started. So actually, let me show my screen with you real quick. Boop. Uh, so you can see exactly what I see. Did that work? Is my screen being shared? That did work. Yeah, so I, I've got, let me refresh. Yeah, maybe because I'm doing a live share, it didn't. Um... After you installed the instec uh, after you installed the instec extension, did you reload the window by any chance? I have not reloaded the window. Let's reload the window. Okay, that um, will probably end our live share and I can just start a new one, but yeah. Okay, let's do that. Let me reload. Boom. Cool. Loading, loading, loading. Yeah, so no user API okay. key. So maybe I have to log in first. It's not going to show me them until I log in. Well, the logins to Studio. I wonder yeah. why it's not popping up. Um, well, that's part of the tool that I created, right? It's not going to be a real demo unless, you know, some of those things Absolutely. don't pop up, right? But I could just create okay. one or load if there's like a... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's up to you. Yeah, the, the getting started section is more of just like the internal docs. But if you click that little plus button inside of there, that will... Should prompt you... Didn't prompt you anything, did it? No, I think I might have broke it. Let me restart VS Code because it is an extension. And so... That's like rule number one for me anyway. I might yeah. have like conflicting extensions. We also did it through uh, live share. It's just all ringing of things if I should restart this. 
I've definitely had those uh, challenges. It seems like every time you install a new extension with VS Code, like quit VS Code and restart it. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it gets pretty rough. Um, okay, so let's see, so we've got this. Uh, this is still showing up too. Like, that's what I mean. Like this VS code live share is not live anymore. So why is it there? All right. Um, so live share, let me get this link going back to you. Actually, you can see my screen. So before I even do a live share, let's just go back to workbench and get that going first. And then we can deal with, um, this. Okay. So I'm just going too fast and breaking everything. Bingo. All right. So now, well, maybe I should wait for it to load just to be sure. Bingo. Okay. Hey, and look uh, there at that. we go. Yeah. We're getting started. Second. Awesome. Yeah, so if you click on one of those, it should preview a markdown file. And this is kind of like the documentation I put inside of there. Yeah. Um, that's got some details. So that's awesome. Uh, for anyone else in the future, that's some pieces in there. But now we should be able to click that plus button and create a new workbench file. Okay, very cool. All right, so let me get rid of this. Let's do. There we go. Uh, you must open a folder to create workbench files. That's well, that's interesting. So that was probably what was going on. Um, I will do documents. Um, oh no, projects. New folder. Uh, and we will call this introduction, no, introducing Apollo Workbench creates, and this will be my folder. The main reason like the tool needs to have a folder open is because when it creates a workbench file, that's actually going to be a local file that it's created. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I should have done this differently and I should have started from probably creating like a folder, like a project, and then opening code from within there. All right, but we're good now. So that that's what matters. Yeah, we're, we're there. <laughs> like you said, it wouldn't be a demo unless I had to figure it out. But this is actually what I love doing because like these are some of the things that you might have run into. And now you'll be like, oh crap, all I have to do uh, is reload yeah. VS Code and I'm good to go. But that's why I love streaming so much. All right, so boom. Plus now here we go. We can enter a name for our workbench file. What should I call it? And whatever graph you want to call, we're actually going to start designing out a small little graph right here. Okay. So, uh, let's see, what do I want to make a graph about? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah. Right. Not <laughs> to put you on the spot at all. Um, what's an upcoming project that I've been wanting to work on? Um, I want to create like, uh, I don't know. I got a bunch of stuff. I'm really freezing up here. How about this? We're working on something now for skate spots. That might be interesting. Um, or let's do like an airline. You want to do like a federated graph for like an airline? Let's do All it. Right. Uh, so we'll call this one accounts. Is that what I'm doing? Am I creating like a, a like a, a service? You're creating graph? the whole graph. The whole graph? So I would call it like airline. Yeah, like airline graph. Or... Got it. Uh, oh, I know. Um, we'll call it fly with Kurt. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Perfect. All right, cool. So we're going to fly with now. Kurt. Now, yeah, you can click that button. Yes. To load it up. Uh -huh. The way you load workbench files is you just click on it in that local workbench files. So if you have multiple ones, you can switch between gotcha. them. Gotcha. 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 So now you'll notice under the current workbench schemas, it says no schemas in selected workbench file. Oh, and yeah. that's because we just have a blank workbench file. Yeah. So if you click that plus button right here on that current workbench schemes. Yep. That's adding like the first service. So ah, this is what would be accounts, got it. for example. Got it. Okay. So we'll do like accounts or I guess like, I don't know. It's probably what they do for like their people, right? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Usually there's an accounts I'll, type I'll, of thing. I'll take it. <laughs> and so this is a schema. Now, yes. And so now there's a couple of things. So in workbenches, uh, I put some things in with IntelliSense. So if you press control space, you should get some default definitions for designing out this schema file. Okay. So, uh, so if I do like, boop, oh no, oops, that brought up, uh, here we go. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So now if you want to, for example, in Federation, wow. define an entity of where someone can extend it, you can go ahead and click that 
and it should auto-complete everything and give you the cursor just to start typing what the name of that is. So this could be like our user or our account, whatever we want to wow, call it. Wow, this is awesome. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, um, yeah, we'll do an account. Okay, that works. Now here's one thing to try because we don't have a valid schema yet. Try saving the file. And then in the top menu bar for VS Code, if you click view Bring it. and then open up the problems panel. Oh yeah, yeah. Hey. You'll see that it says there's an error. Yeah. So composition errors or schema errors pop up in the tool um, based on that compose and validate. That's just really putting all the tools into a diagnostic collection. That is so awesome. And this is what I, so going back to like getting rid of errors before you go. So now you're getting like linting and it's like, hey, this isn't even valid. Like I already have just put in a type and it's like, yo, your schema, it's a hot mess. Like right now, yep. you should do, we should like figure out how exactly. to add a dumpster fire icon in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Yeah. You know, I, I think you, you're spot on. I mean, it's, it's bringing that up. Now, one thing I would say, uh, because this is just a tool that I've, I've created, yeah. um, it doesn't always point at the right locations in VS code. You can kind of see like for this query or this error, for example, we don't have query defined yet. So it's just saying um, one, one, yeah, report. but like, yeah, but it still makes yeah. sense. I still know what's going on here. And like, yeah, I guess, it, you know, it might not be a hundred percent accurate all the time, but like, honestly, I experienced the same issue a lot in JavaScript land anyway, where like errors take you to stacks that are just like somewhere where you're just like, how did I get here? <laughs> time to go turn around. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, oh I better turn the music off so I can concentrate. <laughs> like that's. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Man. So yeah, so I, yeah, this is awesome, but it's still very useful information. Like, oh crap, I need a query. So like, let's just do that just for the sake of, yep. of showing this off. So now I come here and I'll just do like something like empty. No, oh, I, so I would actually just put me an account. Right oh, there. right. Yeah. Let's have like an entry yeah. point for, for our accounts. Yeah, there we go. Um, now if you save that file that composition error should disappear. Boom. No problems are detected yep. in this workspace. Yes. I love there you go. it. Now, therapy. there's another change that popped up here, and I think this is one thing that's really exciting in a developing world of Federation is around a CSDL file, which is composed schema. So in that current workbench schema's uh, tree view, there's a composed schema CSDL row that you can click on now right above that accounts. Okay, sorry, hang on one sec. We just got hit with some quick spam up in the chat. So I'm just going to go ahead and take care of that, and then we'll get right back to it. My apologies. Yeah, no worries. What? No user matching that log in. I just, like, literally copied it. Maybe they dipped out already. It's, like, it's a hard username. I can't just type it out. <laughs> so let's do this again. Slash. Boom. And goodbye. Cool. So you're gone. They're gone. Um, but now I, I'll leave their message. It's not like really anything offensive. Okay, cool. So we're good. Um, so continuing on, what am I clicking now? I do apologize for that. No, no worries. Um, so there's the compose schema CSDL row that's above the accounts in the current workbench schemas. Oh yeah. Yeah. <gasps> so that's actually the compose schema that is being Whoa. used to generate query plans and things again. So this, you can just like, as I, add, so at, as I add more schemas, if I come here and I create another one, um, like orders or whatever, uh, these are terrible names for airline domains, but point being, if I do that, uh, like flights or something would be probably pretty useful. Um, yeah. Then uh, it would start to build on top of this. Like it's already showing me like, hey, this is the schema that is like your your gateway schema essentially, right? Like this is how it figures out where to do, how to do things. Yep, yeah, exactly. I love it. This is so cool. So, you know, you, you kind of just jumped ahead of me, but why Maybe. don't we actually try creating that flight? Okay, yeah, I love schema. it. Let's do that. So, boom. Because every account's going to have flights, right? Yeah, right? I mean, that's the whole point. We're an airline service. Come fly with me. Come fly All right, so now no, here's where it gets away. even a little cooler. Never wrong. Okay, yeah. So try the IntelliSense this time. Ooh, oh, I keep hitting the wrong button and bringing up Alfred. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so now notice how that 
entity that you define oh, pops up in the IntelliSense. This is cool. Now, here's another thing. Before you even do, or go ahead and extend it by account ID. So that pi puts everything in there. It puts whatever keys in oh. there, and you can save that file, and that'll pop up in your CSDL now. And it's already here. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. It's so fast. Yo, this is trippy. Now, here's what's really cool. If you go back to the accounts service. Yeah. Now, under account, why don't we add an email field? Yeah, that makes sense. And let's also add um, uh, like an internal ID. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I'll call it like Sid or something like that. Um, yeah. And then uh, I'll just make it like a string. Do you make it a type ID as yeah, well fine. or a string? string yeah, right? it could be a type ID. Either okay. would work. All right, let's do that. Boop. Now let's add another. Now, so when you define an entity, you can have multiple keys. So let's add another at key onto uh, that account type. Okay. And let's give it uh, the fields to be email and SID. Oh, interesting. So do I pass right, it so right here? Uh, no, you'll pass it as a single string with a space between the two. Got it. Got it. Am I doing this right? Or should I just be adding it past ID? Like we don't need a whole nother. Oh, you're key. doing it right. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh no, you were doing it right. Yeah. Okay. That's, All right. that's exactly how you do it actually. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So then here we want email and then we want uh, the SID. It'll be one string. Yeah. With a space in between. Got yeah. Got it. Perfect. Just like that. Got it. Okay. And now if you save that file and go back to like the flights and you did that IntelliSense, you should see both options popping up now. Oh, so like, so you like went online it's four. another, yeah, because this is a different type of extension because we've just defined this other key. Oh, right. this is deep. This is like, it's it, ugh, it's federation all the way down. <laughs> right. Now, here's a couple of things that are, are caveats. You know, I, the tool is not super smart. So yeah. if you already have a type extension, you can only have one extend type by one key in a service. You can't extend. Right the same type by two keys because so it like, kind of nah. confuses everything. Yeah. So you have to pick which one, but um, the key thing is as a service owner, I should be able to understand, you know, what are my extension points? And if you actually press control space one more time in that editor, notice how it says in the documentation right there, owning service accounts. Yeah. So because the CSDL has graph ownership inside of it, we're wow. also able to tell you like where is that type originating uh, from which is really cool because it's like in most times like we're we've got a whole conway's law thing happening right like our communication yep. structures like i already know who to go talk to if i'm like you know we're in a big org everybody's working on their own graphs i want to add something but i have questions like i'm already getting ownership information at least like a, a head start and uh, that's really interesting. That's really cool. Hundred percent. Now, now that we've kind of seen some of that IntelliSense piece, why don't we delete that second account extension and yeah. let's define like a flight? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Uh, okay, so we got our type flight. We'll want an ID, right? Like that's that goes without saying. Yep. What else? What else do we want on our flight? Uh, there's probably like a, a, a destination yeah. and yeah, origin. What's it called? Like takeoff airport? Yeah, yeah, origin. That's that's the right word. Yeah. So we do or, <laughs> origin, and we'll just make this like for simplicity's sake, string. Yeah. Uh, destination. Uh, string, because realistically, those would probably be another type, which could actually be its own federated service, like of like airport locations mm -hmm. like i don't know what that would be called but that would actually make a lot more sense like you know in in this yeah. scenario well and here's what's really interesting about you talking about that actually i find location services being a very good individual federated service because yeah. a lot of that data is static and if you do something like whole query caching for that individual federated service yeah 
you can actually have where the gateway will send something like automatic persisted queries to your downstream federated service. So there's a lot of opportunities to have caching at different layers in your federated graph. Yeah. So you're, you're definitely on point with your thoughts there. Uh, Kyle in chat said menu for the food, which is very important. So we will add menu. <laughs> very important. I cannot forget that. I love it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah. So that, that's like, uh, a really good point too, which is like, you, you know, it's, ugh, it just seems so much easier to think about the domains and like come to, uh, the contract of ownership and, and think about it, like being able to plan it out. Like, the, like we're not actually building schemas. There's no server here. We have to start to test this and run it. We're just in VS code you know, just kind of taking some notes, really, like um, uh, building out a federated uh, schema. Yeah, this is really awesome stuff. Um, I guess, yeah, what else do we want on our flight? I mean, technically, this is going to probably break because there's no query. Or we don't need it because we're extending. Nope. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You just need one query exposed query in your entire federated yeah. graph. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Now, let's put flights on the account. So we have that showing up on that type. Ah, uh, yeah. And then we're gonna do something fun. Right, yeah, we gotta do this. Like, otherwise, what's the point? Okay, so flights, we'll have our flights. Uh, bum -bum. Now here's another thing. If you delete that flight array real quick. Yeah, and just have, like, get rid of, like, leave the whole back end off like this. Yeah, just delete that and press control space. Oh. should give you options. Oh, looks like flight is missing a character. But <laughs> that's still super dope. Real bugs live. Yeah. But it's supposed to give you, yeah, the options of what's available in that that's schema. That's super dope. That's awesome. Okay, cool. So we've got that. So this is like... All right. Fully composed. You got You got your graph working. You have no problems in there. So now one of the other things that's part of this modeling is you want to start modeling out like use case client scenarios that are associated with yeah. this. So that's where this current workbench operations section lives. So there's a plus button there that you can click and let's write our first one, which will say my like flights. my flights. Yeah. Be the, yeah. Uh, oh, oops. Yeah. It's a query so, name. Let yeah. me redo that. That's okay. You can just you can just delete the space in between. Yeah. Of my and can I? Will it matter if I like capitalize it? Because now that I'm like like Pascal case no. because right now, that's just <laughs> I'm like ah uh, okay. So we'll fix that. Yeah. That's fine. But now I know like I would name this like as I would name my query. So that's cool. Yeah, I guess I didn't really think about that. Uh, but well, yeah, <laughs> I should have put dashes at the least. Like I am creating a file, so normally I would use like dashes. I just got too excited. <laughs> yeah. uh, so then the problems panel also will show operation errors. So you can see that it says like syntax error, and it's basically as we don't have anything defined. But if you're online too, you can press control space and you should get type completion for whatever's in the CSDL. And I am, and look at that. Ooh, that is nice. So you should be able to write a query all the way down to those flights Told now. you, it's federation all the way down. Look at that. We'll grab the ID and we'll grab the menu for Kyle because I know he's hungry. <laughs> now, if you save that file, um, what that'll do is it will allow you to generate query plans against it now. So if you hover over that my flights row, right here in the, you can right click yeah. it. Ooh, open query plan. It's open query plan. The little icon on that row too is opening the That's query what plan. I figured, but yeah. this is the execution path. Wow. Look at this. This is so wild. Like, so I just love looking at this kind of stuff. Like, it's just interesting to me because, like, I, I don't know. I, I did some time where it's like learning. I was considering like going into like IT type stuff, but uh, learning about networking and protocols and all that fun jazz. And it's just like, in some ways, this like reminds me of like a DNS like service, right? It's just like, oh, where am I going to fetch all of this different information from? Uh, uh, yeah, I just think it's really cool. Like query planning as a whole. It's like, oh, hey, we'll figure out the most optimized way to go fetch all of your data and provide it back for you. 
Yeah, totally. And I mean, the, the thing I think about in here is when you start designing and developing with Federation as someone who's has some level of ownership in the graph, I should easily be able to understand the graph, have that observability into where my boundaries are, things like that. I should be able to make tweaks yeah. to what's in there. And I should be able to see how that impacts the execution of an operation. Because you might have, for example, some design that has a query plan that's generated that isn't ideal. And you might add an app provides directive or an app requires directive somewhere in your schema yeah. that fundamentally changes what that query plan being generated is. And you should be able to see that you know, right away. Um, before you actually go trying to implement, you know, what you think is the solution, you'll be able to know now. Yeah, which is, it's just like ugh, the amount of, and again, it just goes back to like this conversation about abstract. Like before you, you know, this would be like either a, a conversation involving like two folks in a whiteboard or in this case, like some kind of like, you know, whimsical tool or something, right? But like you'd be drawing yeah. this out on your own or there'd be some diagram somewhere that was made in something or on something that would represent this. Uh, I mean, that's how I've always done it because what else can you do? Um, yeah. But yeah, so this is, you know, um, it's really nice to just have this laid out for you. Copy and pasteable. Like I can take this and send this to someone like, hey, if we do this, here's what our query plan is going to end up looking like. Like, and now we can converse around this like you know like because maybe this affects yeah. our, our our the accounts team in an adverse way maybe they're not prepared for this you know um uh data to be accessed x amount of times now or something you know it's just yeah it's really interesting well and here's the better part well i don't know if it's the better part but here's a part of an the awesome puzzle part. if you click yeah. on the file yeah if you click on the files icon in the top left of vs code you'll see the folder that we have open there will be one file in here and that is what we just designed yeah so if you sent that to someone else and they open that file that's right in a folder with this workbench they'll be able to recreate this entire thing from where you are that's really interesting now i got one step further with that if you click on uh the top menu bar view and uh, open the command palette Boom. Type in start, and it might be the only thing that pops up. Uh, oh, no, I got and then space mock. Oh, start mock servers? Is that what we're going for here? That's that's the command. Okay, so we've done that. Now, in VS Code, now I don't have a great like feedback UI experience in this, yeah. but at that problems tab, those three dots, if you click that and go to the output, there's a tasks drop down, and this is for any VS Code extension. There will be an area, so that, that workbench is essentially the output of every time you do something, what's going on in the background. So what Start Mock Servers does is it actually starts up a local Apollo server instance for each one of those schemas no and starts way. the gateway for that. So if you navigate to localhost 4000 now, you'll be able to see, you know, GraphQL Playground running with that schema you designed and you can execute that query against it and see mock data be returned. Let's try so this So a out. client team can generate their types, they can start working on developing their stuff locally, and, you know, the, all, all the parties can work independently in this situation now. This is really wild. <clears throat> oh, well, this was from something else. But if I just get rid of this. Why don't you just copy the query you just generated oh, inside of Workbench? That's a great idea. Why don't I do that? <laughs> so we go back here. My flights. Oh, I already had it open. We're going to copy this whole query. Boop. Oh, my goodness. Shut the front door. Really? I'll be right back. I have to go shut my door. <laughs> like, what <laughs> is this? This is awesome. So it's like, not only can you just like share the whole uh, workbench, but like, honestly, there's a whole bunch of ways I could share that. If I just wanted someone to be able to experience like this, just like I could, while I'm working, I could just have a tunnel running to my um, playground um, instance or anywhere I could run this like, uh, um, I wonder if this runs as like a dev graph as well inside of studio. I bet it does. You definitely could. And I will say that I've had a lot of conversations with the engineering team around dev yeah. graphs. And I think 
there will be a lot more that comes in the future around you know the the overall development experience. Yeah. I think there's a lot of inspiration the team is is starting to pull from seeing an example in a tool like this. I'd say this is this is Watson's version of like what I think designing federated schemas should look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, and and this is amazing. And again, so like from a solutions team standpoint, I can only imagine how valuable this tool is. Um, I, you know, I've been talking a lot about inter, you know, like a lot of like folks who are working, um, you know, most likely close together, have a lot of shared context and like, you know, that will still require a lot of uh, transfer of information to be on the same page about things. But like when you talk about working with people maybe who are outside of your organization like what if um uh you know you're working with a solutions team or contractors or i don't know a gazillion other ways in which somebody might be um wanting to contribute to your graph so this is really awesome stuff yeah no it, i i think it it's definitely a tool that also helps us do things like creating minimum reproduction samples of, oh, yeah. you know, what might be a pattern in federation that isn't ideal. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the other things that it also has baked into it. So you have to log in to see this, um, but there is an example graph section inside of there. And we're starting to bake examples of different schemas inside of there. Yeah. Um, it, what I can do, I don't know if you have a way of, can I like Slack you a file? Yeah, you can Slack whatever you want. Yeah, Slack and things should be fine. Yeah, so what I can do is I can Slack you one of the files that's actually inside of like that example oh, yeah. section. So you could just move that file into this folder and uh, cool. you'll see you know, everything inside of and there. While, while you're doing that, Curly Dev, I saw you sneak it in there with that follow. Thank you, much appreciated. Uh, welcome to the stream. So what I'm doing is I just getting uh, this projects, um, this project open, uh, so that I'll be ready to drop that right in. And I see I heard a, a Slacky message. Here we go. All right. Yep. So if you just download that file and move it into this folder, you should be able to click the refresh button on that local workbench files, and it should pop up. Yeah, got it. All right. So I've got this open let me drop it in here okay so that's done and let's reload oops hey look at that and it's in there so easy there we All go right, so let's click on this let's so now you can go ahead and click that yeah. now one thing that's a little jarring in this that i've i've gotten some feedback on and when you click a new workbench file, it's going to close all the files Which makes sense. that are open in the editor yeah. to kind of like reset things. So that's one of the things it'll ask you to save if it's not saved. Uh, well, so, that's good. yeah. Uh, uh, but here's an example of uh, a larger e-commerce schema that has a lot more details in there. There's some to do's and some things that we're still adding out, but it has some examples of queries of, uh, you know, what would be like relevant to a specific website page yeah. or a client UI. Um, this is awesome. And so being able to add more details of like, well, what do maybe uh, an example graph that's larger and more representative of my organization going to be? Um, this is so wild. And so we're trying to get some more examples out there with that. Yeah, and you know, this is another, another uh, use case that I'm seeing here is... Um, like if, if you're trying to introduce GraphQL to an org, it can oftentimes be difficult, but like, uh, you know, cause people want to know like, well, well, how do you define everyone gets like very focused in on like the one graph thing. And they're like, well, now all our governance is gone and all the rules are gone, you know? And yeah. it's like, no, like you can actually show them like, no, look, here's how we draw these clear boundaries. And not only are you showing them an example, but it's like literally the the schema that's like, you know, can also exist. Of course, it might, you know, fields might change or whatever from a prototype to production. But point being is that those connections are going to be very similar uh, and they get to see it well before you start coding anything. I just that alone, like before you have to spin up an API gateway and three services and tie those together to demo it, you can actually now just set up some stuff in a workbench. 
that's that's huge. Yep. Yep. And you know, we were talking about earlier. Go ahead and click the locations service uh, oh, inside yeah. of this example. Yeah. I think we actually made this. Yeah, where an address has an, essentially an ID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and we were we were taking some examples from you know what's out there in the public, and this is actually something similar that we've seen in other e-commerce. Some of them will have like latitude, longitude yeah, as, as like the key identifier in there as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely. That's awesome. That's um, hilarious. But yeah, this is so, cool. And again, you're saying you have a couple of these like vertical stacks, right? Like e-commerce is one example. Um, what are some of the other ones that are in there? Yeah, e-commerce is the first one. Um, we're, we're actually working through designing out some, some other verticals in, inside of there. Um, I think there's still some decision of like which verticals to do. Yeah. Um, we actually made the decision just recently. We're going to try and put out more pattern examples Ooh. as far as like okay. some workbench file yeah. things for our customers. I like that. So I think we'll start out with the e-commerce one. We have a Cephi in there. Um, we have an example of like errors with unions Ooh, inside of a federated that's graph. That's really nice. Have like yeah. errors on your schema. Yeah. Yeah. So I think more examples like that, like we're going to have a list of these things. How do we start doing more of that to give those smaller bite size examples? And those will play into the other verticals that we build up over that's time. That's awesome. And, you know, the plan is for this to be open source. So, uh, folks, that means you'd be able to create example workbenches as well. Like, you know, you want to I, I, I just again going to use cases like showing, you know, something you could even add to your resume. Like I understand how to architect federated services. You know, it's like here's a working example and like you don't even have to have something running up and running and, and that infrastructure. Like honestly, federation is something that I've been wanting to understand more deeply, but it's difficult because I don't have a big uh, system of, uh, you know, um, uh Federal, you know, microservice architecture running behind multiple graphs that I can just dive into, right? And it's, so it's like, well, yeah. how do I uh, expand? You know, and I've been looking at like ideas to build something, but now I get to jump ahead and just say, well, first, let me just like dive into federation and building these relationships, see what those query plans look like. And like, I can understand this uh, from the outside as opposed to like having to spin it up and, and get it running to, to do it. So it, from a teaching perspective, I also see a ton of value in this. Like if I want to workshop federation or help somebody solve a problem in the community and they're doing something with federation, like I could just give them a workbench. File. Absolutely. Like that's like a hundred percent. Yeah. Everyone can now be on the same page and you know, it's like, how do I do this in federation? Like here's a working example of it yeah. that, you know, they could then also tweak and play around yeah. with and expand on and, and move forward with. Yeah. Um, you know, one other thing I'd, I'd just tag in here, it's not in this version, but um, this is actually a second iteration of what I initially built, because what I initially built was a, a TypeScript project that you would run and it had different scripts to like start the workbench and like do all these things. And one of the things I had was um, an export script to export your workbench file yeah. into uh, a, you know, one zipped up project that has uh, mocked resolvers for your entire graph. So it gives you now kind of a jumping point of like design it. Now let's build it. And I'll be adding that piece back. That's in. awesome. It's just hasn't hit there. Yeah. Yet. But that is, that is really wild. Um, that's amazing. Like, yeah. Cause I didn't even thought of that. Like now, not only are you designing, but now then it can spit out like, Hey, here's your starting point. This is already, you already know this is what you want. Now just come in and fill in the blanks. Like it's like cookie cutter, yep. like, like just connect it to your, you know, whatever your data sources are and you're off, off to the races. This is absolutely amazing. Yep. Yeah. There's all good stuff. Like, so, you know, and it's solving, uh, problems for the solutions team immediately. It looks like it's going to solve a lot of problems for the community, um, at large, both, uh, you know, people from all the way from education to enterprise. So, uh, kudos to y'all, uh, super awesome work. We absolutely love it. A uh, little round of applause there for you. Thank yeah, you. no, thank you. We, we should be thanking you. Um, but yeah, so I guess we're, you know, we're coming up kind of on time here. So I think I want to wrap up. Do you have like, you know, like 
we talked a little bit about like what do you see as the future of this tool uh, you know and we talked slightly about like you know we're at the cusp of like you know tooling in general with with graphql like i feel like we're like barely scratching the surface with what's possible yeah like get me hyped what, what's coming yeah. up <laughs> yeah you know i think the the big thing that's going to be coming up around this i think is what our team will end up pulling into apollo studio i think there's a lot of uh different pieces that can start being connected you know one downside with this tool is for example having these flat files um, I was actually uh, using a Workbench file as a reproduction case for one of our customers with the famous James Baxley uh, <laughs> nice. with a federation issue. And uh, I, we ended up getting out of sync on the, the Workbench file that we were you know, sharing between each other. So you can see where a world yeah. of you know, being able to share just a URL, for example, oh, yeah. is, is very desirable. Yep. Um, you know, I think the, the thing that I'd get really excited about in here um, is really the developer lifecycle workflows that are really enabled yes. by this tool. And, you know, it's great to start from scratch, but one of the big pieces inside of here is, you know, when you log into studio, being able to pick up your graph from where it is in production and start planning out a we change or staging or that. whatever. Yeah, that is huge. Yeah. Yeah. We just went from scratch. That's, that's a big, yeah. big thing. Yeah. 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 That is huge. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It also has the ability where when you log into studio, you can click on any of your graphs and it'll actually load operations from your graph. So you may, for example, have, hey, there's this really slow operation happening in well, studio. Look at the query and plan you want and to yeah, yeah, it, yeah, look at the query plan, maybe make a change to the design because of that. And this now starts bleeding you into the world of like copy the graph, add in this specific operation, mm -hmm. make some tweaks, view the query plan. You know, now this looks good. Let's go implement this change. Yeah, that's mind boggling. It's just like a completely different. It's just rare to see a tool have an effect across so many different areas. You know, it's one of the things I love about Explorer as well, which is uh, in Apollo Studio as well. It's like a really a GraphQL IDE. I, I mean, those these two things pair together like. I don't know, peanut butter and jelly or something, but like, yeah, like, you know, it yeah. just, it, it's like, it, it makes change. It changes people's daily lives, like across many different, uh, like teams or orgs, you know, it's not just developers who will benefit from it, but developer adjacent teams as well. Designers, QA product managers, uh, you know, like the list goes on of, of people who want access to that data marketing, like who knows who would need that data customer solutions, um, uh, customer success, like stuff like that. Like all these people can benefit from graph data accessibility. So I don't know. Yeah, sorry. I'm just kind of like rambling at this point. But the whole point is, is like I'm super hyped on things that actually get, um, uh, you know, like cover just a lot of different use cases and just like they just end up becoming a part of your life. You don't even kind of realize, you know, uh, Kyle, thanks for stopping in. Yeah. yeah uh, so Scurry Twitch is just dropping in. So we don't have a link for the extension yet. We're working on getting this uh, to open source. So then it would just be a release. You'll just be able to go right to uh github and download the latest release and this is uh you know team's working on it right now it's an internal tool that's being used by the solutions team uh here at apollo but stay tuned because definitely we'll be uh, uh having more information for you on this uh early in the new year so you're definitely going to want to stay in touch you've got my twitter handle and watson's twitter handle right there uh underneath the title of the stream feel free to give us a follow and i guarantee you'll hear about it if you do Well, this has been super fun, Kurt, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join this stream. Yeah, um, always love talking about schema design. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, Federation is a, an, a, an amazing topic. It's something that I truly love. I'm a huge fan of like domain-driven design. I believe um, uh, in the, uh, 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 I guess, like benefits of, of microservices. I see Federation as like the GraphQL version of that. So yeah, I love talking about this stuff. Could go for hours. And on that note, y'all hit us up on Twitter if you've got questions about this. Uh, you know, you don't have to just wait for that release date. If you want to know more, uh, yeah, hit us up. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get out of here. Uh, we're going to get back to it. we got a lot of other awesome stuff that we want to do, especially starting in the new year. So stay tuned, folks. 
Thank you for coming by. Watson, again, thank you for joining me. And with that, we are out. Thank you. See you later, folks.